So I would like to welcome you to the RNA Innovation Seminar Series here from the University of Michigan. My name is Mats Jungmann, and I'm the co-director of the Center for RNA Biomedicine here at the University of Michigan. And I have the great privilege to be moderating today's seminar uh, with two very innovative uh, investigators here from the University of Michigan. And I'm sure you've uh, heard a lot of buzz around CRISPR to uh, edit and cure a lot of diseases. And you probably heard the buzz around spatial transcriptomic. And lucky for us, both of these hot topics will be presented today by these two um, very innovative uh, investigators from Michigan. So first up is uh, Zong Gang Hu. Um, he is a research investigator from the Department of Biological Chemistry. Um, Zong Gang started his uh, academic training at Peking University. He came to uh, uh, University of uh, Wisconsin in Madison, where he did his PhD. He studied transcriptional silencing in yeast. Uh, he stayed at Wisconsin, did postdoc, um, and learned about uh, embryonic stem cells, pluripotent stem cells, and how to use CRISPR to manipulate uh, these types of cells. And then in 2015, he went to Harvard, where he was the director of uh, the gene editing core there. And then in 2017, he came to Michigan um, as a research investigator with Yan Zhang, Zhang's group um, at the Department of Biological Chemistry. And um, the title for uh, Zigong's uh, talk is Harnessing Diverse Compact CRISPR-Cas3 for Long-Range Genome Engineering. And if you do have questions during the talk, please use the Q&A button and um, write in your question, and I will moderate that in the end. So. With that, go ahead, Zong Gang Hu. Thank you, Matt, for the uh, nice introduction. I would also like to thank the uh, organizers of this RNA Innovation Seminar Series for providing us with this uh, nice platform to share our work with the broader uh, scientific community. As you can see from my title that I'm going to be talking about, or as Matt mentioned, I'm going to be talking about CRISPR uh, genome engineering. So whenever I mention CRISPR genome engineering, most people think about CRISPR-Cas9. And understandably so, let me see if I can, okay. Understandably so, since its introduction in the late 2012, CRISPR-Cas9 definitely caused a revolution in the field of genetic engineering, as evident by this the, uh, explosion of publications using Cas9 for gene editing. And then since then, Cas9 and its close relative uh, Cas12 and Cas13 has been developed into various uh, tools for gene editing, epigenetic control, chromatin imaging, base editing, RNA targeting, and most recently uh, COVID detection. And so it's definitely not an overstatement to say that CRISPR has touched pretty much every aspect of our lives. And that also led to the Nobel Prize for Jennifer Downa and Emmanuel Chapentier last year for uh, the uh, Nobel Prize in Chemistry. So CRISPR is a very, very diverse system. It can be divided into two classes, class one and class two. So as you can see in this slide, you can probably tell all the, all the well-known uh, members of the, uh, of the gene editing field, CAS9, CAS12, CAS13, they all belong to this class two uh, CRISPR system. So member in this class, uses a single protein for, our, for uh, the uh, target recognition and destruction, while members in class one uses multi-subunit protein complexes for the same purpose. So most people probably don't know that class two only accounts for roughly 10% of all identified cat, uh, CRISPR systems. So to put into in, in perspective, the, it's more like this. That's a very tiny bit of the CRISPR system. And so, well, the majority of the identified CRISPR system belong to class one. And so think about that 10% of the CRISPR already revolutionized the whole field. Have, so the 90, what, imagine what 90% can do. And so within this class one, 
type one system is the most dominant system in CRISPR. So it accounts for roughly 50% of the whole CRISPR system. So we really want to just take advantage of this diversity and see if we can actually develop novel tools for gene editing. So what's different? Uh, between Cas, uh, between type one and then uh, the uh, famous Cas9. So here shown on the left is, is, uh, is how Cas9 works. Cas9 uses a single guide RNA and to find its target on the, on the DNA, then initiate double strand break. While in the type one system, the target, target search is actually carried out by a protein complex called Cascade. It uses the CRISP RNA to find its target on the DNA then once it finds this target, it recruits a separate protein called Cas3. Cas3 has both nuclease and helicase activity. And then so once, it's, once it gets recruited to the target, it travels along the DNA and then cleaves DNA along the way. The end result is large fragment DNA deletion. And so we really wanted to target this the, uh, Cas cascade Cas3 to human genome and see what it can do to the human genome. And so this is a very nice collaboration between our lab and Ilon Kuss lab at Cornell University. Ilon is an expert in the uh, type one uh, CRISPR structure and biochemistry. And so one of the reason the type one system is so underutilized is the nature of its com composition. So we have to express one, two, three, four, five, six uh, protein coding genes plus a CRISPR for it to function. And so that's probably why many people prefer to use a, type, a class two system. And so just to increase our chances of success, we decided to use the uh, type one E CRISPR from TFUSCA. This is a system that I don't studies and knows a lot about this system. And then our strategy is actually to first purify the cascade complex, instead of expressing in each individual subunit in the human cells, we actually first purify the complex already loaded with the guide RNA from E. coli, and then we purify Cat3 uh, from E. coli separately. And this is done by a then graduate student, Adam Dolan in Ilon's lab. Then once we get the purified protein, we electroporate the protein into our reporter cell the reporter cells we use is a human embryonic stem cell that's labeled with a TD tomato and GFP. So it's a dual reporter cell line. And so then we would de deliver into the reporter cell line. And then we actually design two guides. One targets GFP, the other targets TD tomato. And so we were very hard, happy in our first try, we got some positive results. So as you can see in this facts plot, on the very, on the very right, this is the uh, when we deliver the GFP targeting cascade in plus Cat3 protein, we started to see a GFP negative population. Well, if you leave out cascade, or if you leave out Cat3, the, popu the GFP population is not there. And also if you use a non-targeting CRISPR, and then that also has no effect on the GFP expression. And this activity is also programmable. And so if we, use, if we load the cascade with the TD tomato targeting guy, then instead of GFP negative cells, we start to see TD tomato negative cells, which means that this is basically a programmable uh, DNA targeting module. Since, as I mentioned before, type one uh, introduces long DNA fragment deletions. So we really wanted to see what kind of lesions that we have in these negative populations. So we use, so we, so, we designed a few primers, and then that will amplify a long, re a long uh, fragment uh, around the uh, target site. So now you can see from each, uh, so, we, so shown here is two primer, two amplifications. The, the first lane is no transfection, and the last lane, lane four, is the uh, sorted GFP negative cells. It's a population of GFP negative cells. So you can see that we're actually getting a ladder of small DNA fragments which indicates that we are actually getting uh, DNA deletions, which is also long. Some of the deletions are pretty long. Then we use the traditional Sanger sequencing and also uh, deep sequence, next generation deep sequencing to further characterize those lesions. Shown on the slides on the left, these are the, each, each line is, an, in, is a unique deletion event. And the black, black line indicates the deleted DNA region. So the, 
the the dotted the blue line is where the guy uh, binds, where the guy recognizes, and so we can see that the deletion is quite heterogeneous, and so the deletion starts roughly around several hundred base pairs from the target site, and the deletion ends like few kb, tens of kb, even hundreds of kb away from the recognition site, and it's mostly the unidirectional, so it only happens on one side of the guide RNA. And then use deep sequencing. We actually look at the, the uh, overall deletion profile. We can see the deletion efficiency is quite uniform within the first 10 KB. And then it gradually drops. And then we can even get deletions that sometimes up to 100 KB long. So these are basically long range, unidirectional, heterogeneous uh, deletions that we can get from the type one system. So just to see, what can you actually do with these kind of systems? So first of all, you can delete a large genomic region. And so this is actually good for full gene removal. So most people use Cas9 to do gene knockouts. Cas9 introduces indels, which causes premature stop codons. So one study, a few studies, a couple of studies actually found that up to a third of those mutants actually accumulate the barren protein products, which will actually uh, complicate the final readouts. But using, using type one, we can probably achieve full gene removal, which will give you a cleaner screening result. And also we can use that for screen for non-coding elements. So one guide RNA actually give you a huge library of deletion mutant, which is not bad. That actually reduces your cost of, of screening. Instead of using Cas9, you have to design thousands of paired guides to actually achieve the same thing. Lastly, if we knock out Cas, Cas3's nucleus activity and still leave its helicase activity intact, while it travels along the DNA, it can serve as a long-range delivery platform for, say, for epigenome modifier or for other uh, modification enzymes. So after we publish our results and the several other labs also publish results using type one for either gene editing or gene activation or transcription modulation in eukaryotes. And not coincidentally, everybody uses a type one yeast system. Type one yeast is actually the most, uh, it's probably because it's uh, the most well-studied system in within type one. However, it's also very big. It's roughly, the whole system is roughly seven to eight KB long. And then, uh, so that makes the uh, delivery via DNA or, or virus a bit challenging. And then while protein purification is also not easy for everyone. So just to, uh, to make this tool more friendly to the broader scientific community, we start to look for the uh, more, like a more compact systems and smaller systems. Since type one is so diverse, then, uh, then it's, there, it's probably easy for us to find one. And then we focused on the 1C system, which is small, it's, a, it's the most compact system in type one, and it's roughly five to six KB long. And then, uh, so it has only three gene for cascades, so Cas5, 8, and Cas7, and plus a Cas3 for de DNA degradation. And so a former master student, Ryan Kruger, used bioinformatics and found one 1C system in a uh, favorite bug in Nigeria, and it's, uh, it's from Nigeria Lactamica, as a, this CRISPR system it has a very nice 1C system. And then he used the uh, bioinformatics to define the PAM sequence. Then he cloned all the required genes into E. coli. And then he showed that in E. coli, this system is functional. It's basically very active through plasma interference. So once you deliver, once you induce the induction of the, of the CRISPR system, you see all the E. coli start, start to die off because of, they lost the plasma for resistance. Then another, grad, uh, another master student, Max, purified the protein. So we purified the uh, cascade complex. Then we also purified the Cas3 protein. We delivered into the same reporter line. And this time we were very pleasantly surprised that this system is highly active. And so we're getting roughly 50% of the GFP negative cells uh, in, in using the same reporter while we're getting roughly 10 at most to 15% with the previous system. And so this is all very nice, but protein purification is not, is not that easy. And then just to make, the, the, make this more user-friendly, we decided to develop a RNA-based delivery platform. And so we cloned all the cascade encoding genes and class three into an individual uh, plasmid for human cell expression. 
and then also a CRISPR expression plasmid. We transfect the cells into our reporter line, and then we were kind of disappointed to see that the efficiency is quite low. So pretty much very close to background. And can, while Cas9 gives really high efficiency in terms of GFP in GFP inactivation. And we check on the protein expression of all subunit expressives. And so what, what's causing this? We're really not sure. There's a million different reasons that that might lead to this low efficiency of plasma-based editing. And so we were stuck. Then came in a new PhD candidate student, Rinke Town. And so it's, you know, it's all nice to have a fresh set of eyes to look at your result. And so she looked at the Max's purification and then of the cascade complex and noticed that this was banned. This, this was a band that we all basically uh, dismissed as a de degradation during the, uh, during the purification. But she actually cut out the band and sent for Edmund sequ sequ and terminal sequencing. And this span, this band actually matches to the C terminus of Cas8, one of the subunits for the cascade, basically this one. And so it matches to the C terminus. It starts with actually has a start codon. It also has a predicted ribosome binding site, which, which indicates this is probably internal uh, translation, alternative internal translation product. And then Renko mutated the ribosome binding site and also the start site. And, and indeed, that band is gone. Indicate that this is definitely this is indeed a, a, a internal translation product. Then when she knocked out the Cas11, then she tried to the purification again, see what happens. And so, so what she found that once you knock out Cas11, the complex basically falls apart. And so you're showing here on the on the left, you're looking at the gel filtration column. And so the the black line is basically wild type purification. So you can see a very nice uh, peak showing it's the cascade complex formation. And then the dotted line showing Cas11 knockout uh, expression. So you, you don't actually see the cascade complex form at all. And this complex formation can be rescued by supplying Cas11 on a separate plasma. And so the, by showing here on the orange line, you see a nice uh, peak showing the cascade. And then, uh, so she was able to purify both the wild type and the Cas11 rescue RNP when we deliver to the cells and both of them are pretty active. And so maybe that's the thing we're looking for. That, that's the discrepancy between RNP and plasmid-based editing because the internal, internal translation signal for bacteria cannot be recognized by human cells. So in human cells, there will, no, there will be no Cas11. Just to test that hypothesis, Tan, uh, the Ren Club basically uh, cloned Cas11 onto its individual plasma and then transfected all these plasma into human cells. And then, then we were very happy to see that that completely rescued the uh, plasma targeting, plasma based targeting. And so you can see without Cas11, then uh, we get really low level of, of, of editing. While when you add in one Cas11 plasma, the, uh, the editing efficiency goes up 10 to 20 fold. And so this is very nice. And also the same strategy, but basically putting Cas11 in there can actually enable also mRNA based editing. And so we can express all these guys as mRNAs, and then we can electroporate the thing into, into our reporter cells at pretty high efficiency. Uh, so we can use. Uh, RNA for CRISPR, then we can also use DNA plasma for CRISPR, and then we get higher efficiency if we use plasma for to express CRISPR. And so we believe the uh, the supplying Cas11 really enables very robust editing with plasma or mRNA. And then at the at the same time, the uh, the other other labs also identify the uh, the uh, intern this, this internal translation product in type 1b and type 1d and other type 1c system indicating that this is probably a universal phenomenon for the uh, for uh, for the type 1 system for those compact systems 1b 1c and 1d they're all uh, very compact system. So there's a universal phenomenon for all these uh, compact systems. And so indeed, we try basically using this strategy and to see if we can get other system, other uh, 1C or 1D or 1B system to work. And then the, they this uh, putting Cas11 in there definitely makes them work much better. So here's a different 1C system. And so without Cas11, you get pretty much zero uh, 
uh, uh, editing. But once you put in a CAS 11, that increases to roughly 20%. And then for this 1D and 1B, they also, uh, CAS 11, increases the editing efficiency for, for, the, uh, uh, edit, for the whole plasma-based delivery uh, by a lot. And so we believe that this year, uh, using CAS 11 actually opens the door to utilize all a lot of uh, a lot of compact type one systems for gene editing or for other gene uh, for other purposes. So I guess that's uh, that's pretty that's that's all I have for today. And then I would like to thank. So this is a definitely a team effort. I would like to thank all the members in the. Yen Zhang's lab, especially Yen for starting this very bold project. This is a high risk project when she just started her lab. And then uh, also Max and Ryan Rinko, they all putting lots of effort into this project. And we'd like to thank our collaborator, Ai Long, and then uh, his uh, grad, then grad student, Adam, for purifying those protein, eBay and Chen Yi for all helpful discussions. And then uh, last but not the least, and Peter for very nice support for bioinformatic analysis. Thank you, and I would like to take questions. Thank you so much. That was a very interesting talk. Um, please uh, put in uh, questions under q and I can start with one question. Um, so if you were to compare the toxicity of uh, inducing a double strand break with Cas9 versus doing the shredding with Cas3, what would you say? Is it a lot more toxic to do the shredding versus a double strand break? Uh, we actually did not. So based on where you target though, and then if we target non-essential genes and say GFP reporter, we actually do not really see high level of toxicity associated with the, uh, with the delivery of our cascade or type one CRISPR. And then, uh, then most of the, the, the toxicity we actually, uh, I, we, we actually have is as through the plasmid transfection, the plasma itself, DNA is kind of toxic to the cell. Hmm. But the, uh, if we switch to RNP delivery, that's actually not too bad. Okay. Okay, we got a question here. Let me read it for you. Um, this is from uh, uh, Catherine Skoll. Uh, great talk. Do you have any thoughts on what drives the heterogeneity of the length of the deleted regions? Huh, that's, a, that's a very, very good question. And so um, the, there's lots of work being done in, in vitro by single molecule uh, just to look at how Cas3 or Cascade versus, uh, plus Cas3 introduces DNA deletions. And then it's not completely clear yet. And so the idea would be that the uh, the lens, the, the lens is probably affected by local chromatin structure. And so there's a certain chance that when Cat3 hits certain structure, it will just fall off. And there's a certain chance it will actually plow through that, uh, that secondary structure or, or, or other blocks. And so it's, it's basically by chance it will just fall off at a certain point and then other batches will just go on and go on, eventually falls off. So, that's probably one of the reasons that the deletion is quite heterogeneous, quite heterogeneous. Okay, um, please, oh, here's another one. Uh, Ji Feng Zhang, how about the off-target effects of this Cas3? Yes, so Cas3 itself will not actually degrade DNA. A double stranded DNA. So if you just mix Cas3 with double stranded DNA, it does not have any activity. So only when it gets recruited by Cascade to the target site, then it starts to travel and degrade DNA. So by just by just Cas3 itself does not have off-target effect, and then off-target effect mostly happens with the uh, with the Cascade. And then we did some uh, some off-target profiling, and then we found that the uh, the uh, the it te it tolerates. It's kind of like a Cas9 within the first few bases of the guide RNA, then the, it's very sensitive to mismatches. Then outside of that, it starts to tolerate a few, uh, mismatches. And then so we're still working on the off track profiling at this moment. Mm -hmm. Another question I have. So <clears throat> could you um, swap out the Cas3 um, 
shredding activity and place that on Cas9. So you would have an RNA targeting module from Cas9 hooked up with Cas3, so you get a shredder. So just kind of circumventing the 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 cascade uh, proteins and just that's a that's a very interesting thought. We never thought about it. Yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. That we can definitely give that a try. Okay, sounds good. I mean, we we're working with with a dead Cas9 that has a endonuclease attached to it. So I, I think there could be a lot of interesting things you can do with, with adding various things to you know swapping domains and and in the end it, it's to find something that's small and efficient and and so forth. And mm -hmm. in terms of of using the Cas3 system for gene editing, what what are the types of diseases you think it will lend itself very well for? Um, so basically we're looking at, say, if you have uh, uh, certain cancer genes that you want to get rid of, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to screen for non-coding, so there are non-coding regions that will cause diseases and single point mutation or small indels that might not get rid of that non-coding sequence, then using type one will probably be a better choice. And then also in terms of screening, this would be a very nice screening tool that you, you, you target this guy to a certain region, then it will just randomly delete, create deletions of varying length. Then you can screen for non-coding elements, the important elements within that region uh, using that library or that pool of deletions. Hmm. Very interesting. So, so the Cas3 is both the helicase and an endonuclease? Uh, helicase, and then I believe it's endonuclease. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Are there any, um, any other, like in the uh, mammalian genome, any other genes like that, that has that dual function of being a helicase and an endonuclease or? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not aware of anything, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Right, right, right. That's very cool. Okay, um, any more questions from anybody? Last call here before we switch over. Um, if not, thank you again very much, Songong, for, for a very interesting seminar. And, and please go over and pick up your, was it Sun at the? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Don't forget that. Go go ahead and do that. Thank you again. Thank you. Okay, so <clears throat> we are good on time, and uh, let's switch over for the the second talk uh, by Yun He Li. Uh, Yun He is a associate professor at the Department of Molecular and Integrative Physiology here at Michigan. Um, he started his uh, uh, academic career at. Um, the Korean Advanced Institute for Science and Technology, where he did his undergraduate, he did his PhD and his first postdoc there. Then he got a chance to go to the University of California at San Diego and he did his second postdoc there. Um, before coming to Michigan a decade ago to uh, the Department of Molecular and Integrative Physiology. And, and you, uh, Lee, now I don't have your title in front of me, but I'm sure that's on your slide, but you're going to talk about a very innovative and new technology to, to look at spatial transcriptomic that you and your group developed. That's called SeekScope, and it was just published in Cell. It was a really, really nice uh, study. So congratulations on that. And we look forward to hear more of the details from you now. So go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Jungman, for nice introduction. And I really appreciate that I have this opportunity to share our recent technology named SIGSCOPE with you. So yeah, before we talk about the SIGSCOPE technology, I wanted to uh, briefly remind you about the importance of a microscope. So you know that microscope has been very essential for the development of biology because it can allow us to see very, very tiny structures, which cannot be observed through our naked eye. So it can show cellular, subcellular structures, and it has been very essential for development of microbiology, histology, many, many, many important biological disciplines. And now we are, now, now we are living in molecular biology era, 
So basically this uh, microscopy, it has been combined with uh, molecular detection techniques, including immunohistochemistry, which can detect proteins, or RNA in situ hybridization, which can detect different uh, RNA sequences. So we can now see specific biomolecules in, <clears throat> from the histology section, but those methodologies are actually limited because in a single session of histology, they can only monitor a uh, limited number of proteins or RNA species. In contrast, an emerging technology named special transcriptomics aims to examine the, the, all the genes transcribed from the genome at once from a single histology slide. So typically special transcriptomics is uh, implemented using barcode, specially barcoded oligonucleotide arrays. So in those arrays, we can find RNA capturing molecules like oligo DT shown here. So they can capture mRNA molecules. And those RNA capturing molecules are included with a special barcode sequence. So a specific nucleotide barcode sequence can encode the spot X, Y coordinates. So once we overlay the tissue section onto this array, and then RNAs will be released from the tissue. And then these RNA capturing molecules will capture the RNA and then we can perform conventional reverse transcription. So the result is actually the chimeric library that has both special barcode sequence and cDNA sequence. And then we can sequence this library, which is actually the RNA seq. So we can reveal the gene, and using the special barcode, we can actually pinpoint where those specific gene expression is originated from the tissue slide. So this special transcriptomics has been now already implemented in a commercial solution uh, and 10X Genomics last year launched the 10X BGM, which is the first, uh, <clears throat> first generation special transcriptomics. So this uh, special transcriptomics solution actually was very good it, in profiling, special, specially profiling the gene expression landscape. But it has also a limitation because it, it's spot to spot, center to center resolution was limited at 100 micrometer. So actually, we, if we compare that resolution with our naked eye, actually that resolution was worse than our like, naked eye. So actually examining the histology slide using BGM was almost similar to examining the histology slide with your own naked eye probably at one meter away. So even though it can show some special features, actually it didn't reveal the details of tissue histology. So people has been aware of this problem and then there has been a lot of recent developments which used either microbead or microfluidist devices so that we can de uh, actually decrease the center to center distance, increasing the resolution. Indeed, these methods even though not commercialized yet, they can improve the resolution down to the 10 to 20 micrometer resolution. So this has been on an order of magnitude improvement, but still their resolution is around the level of 2X magnifier, which can actually not see the microscopic structures. So here is the problem. So to examine, the microscopic image details. So this, this image is a hypothetical one micrometer resolution image. But if you look at those structures in either a magnifier or a naked eye, actually those special details are all obscured and unobservable. So this has been a big problem. And uh, we imagine that if we are able to generate a very, very tight arrangement of special barcode, which is, uh, let's say, comparable to the microscopic resolution, then we can perform microscopic special transcriptomics. And then if we are able to really implement that, probably it may, be able, it may have a potential to replace a lot of different iterative immunostaining or RNA in situ sessions, saving a lot of time and money. And also it can allow for special single cell analysis because this microscopic resolution will allow single cell examination. And also it can allow for the subcellular analysis because it's, uh, it can show the microscopic structures. So we are, we are able to provide such a solution 
uh, called as a sequence scope or six scope. So here we were able to make a very, very tiny arrangement of different, uh, differently labeled special barcode. So if you compare those uh, pixel structures with a single pixel BGM area, you will be able to see a day and night difference. So this six scope is actually initiated by generation of single-stranded DNA oligonucleotide library. So this library will have official handles, RNA capture sequences, but importantly, it will have a random nucleotide, which we call as high definition map coordinate identifier or HDMI sequences. In this oligonucleotide library, uh, theoretically, each of, each of the library components will have different uh, structures because uh, it will have uh, a lot of sequence diversity. So each of the single molecules will have different sequences. And then we amplify them in on Illumina flow cell platform where it has uh, PCR adapters coated on the surface. So basically we can perform the two dimensional PCR which can generate different HDMI clusters. And then using Illumina sequencing by synthesis method, we are able to determine the sequence of each cluster and their XY coordinates in the special space. So since this is a PCR reaction, each of the cluster has unique sequences, but all the molecules within, the, each, within each cluster will have identical sequences because they are all the total molecules of initial HDMI oligo. And then we process, we, 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 we process the we, we process each of the clusters so that it can expose the RNA capture moiety. And then we overlay our tissue sections on the, onto this six scope array. And then using the, that after that, we are able to generate another library that, that is a chimeric molecule between the HDMI sequences and the cDNA sequences. So we call the first sequencing process uh, determining the XY coordinate as first seq and the RNA seq process as the second seq. So seq scope is uh, composed of the first seq and the second seq process. So first seq of the seq scope will generate a data table that has uh, spot XY coordinate and at the same time HDMI sequences. So basically in the first seq you will have uh, each spot XY coordinate and HDMI sequences determined. And second seq is basically an RNA seq. So you know about the gene expression. So you can get digital gene expression metrics. And at the same time, each of the gene expression is uh, associated with the HDMI sequence. So basically using the HDMI as a special index, you can relate each gene with the coordinates. So each of the gene expression counts from the RNA seq, second seq experiment can be associated with the the XY coordinates that were determined through the first seq process. So theoretically, because we determined that the spot to spot distance is just 0.6 micrometer, theoretically we can do the microscopic examination of special transcriptomics. And then we wanted to know really it can do supposed microscopic analysis and whether we can really see the subcellular structures from the cell. Now, you know that uh, all the RNAs from the cell are basically trans transcribed from the nucleus as an unspliced messenger RNA. But before they are transported into the cytoplasm, they need to be spliced. And then some of the RNAs enter the mitochondria, but mitochondria has its own genome, so it has mitochondrial encoded RNA. Because six scope is basically an RNA seq, we have all the information from the RNA sequences. And then using the sequences, we can know whether the that sequence is either unspliced, spliced, or mitochondrial. So we actually plotted unspliced, uh, spliced, and mitochondrial encoded RNA sequences onto a histological space. And we were able to see that actually we can see a structure that resembles nuclear cytoplasmic structure. We can see that unspliced RNAs are confined in the nuclear-like region, and spliced and mitochondrial RNAs are dispersed throughout the cytoplasm-like region. Those, those, uh, 
even even when we randomly divided the sequences into the three different pools, those observations were reproducibly observed. And we can even do some subcellular analysis so we can identify all the nuclear-like regions. And then we can isolate mRNAs that are enriched inside the nucleus. And we can have a, a list of genes that are nuclear-enriched genes. And actually, there is a recent study which performed physical separation of cytoplasm and nucleus. And then they performed the differential expression between the, between the nuclear expression of mRNAs and cytoplasmic expression of mRNAs. And they showed that a class of mRNAs are enriched in liver cell nucleus. And this is the liver tissue. And actually, we can see that the top genes isolated through the physical separation experiment are consistent with our bioinformatic nuclear identification experiment uh, performed using the six scope data set. So basically, they are uh, their gene lists were I almost identical, meaning that six scope can indeed enable special subcellular transcriptome analysis. Now we wanted to make sure it really represents the nuclear area that uh, unsplice the RNAs are really representing the nuclear area. So we overlaid them with the hematoxylin and eosin staining, and you will be able to see that really the nuclear region shows a highly high expression of unspliced RNA. And using computational cell segmentation method, we were able to even isolate the single hepatocellular area. And using those coordinate information, we can collapse all of the RNA sequence into the single cells. And then actually the RNA, RNA information isolated from those single cell area is uh, actually comparable to conventional single cell analysis technologies like DropSeq or MarsSeq. And we can also perform the conventional single cell analysis as we perform the other single cell data sets. But the unique point of uh, six core is that actually they can perform the special single cell analysis. So basically you can identify each spot originating special space so you can plot them onto the special space and you can even overlay them with histological structure and you will be able to see that actually those uh, uh, special cl classification is consistent with the histological findings so around the portal vein region we were able to find the periportal hepatocyte phenotypes and around the central vein region we will be able to identify pericentral hepatocytes furthermore six scope can also enable examination of individual gene expression. So basically like a conventional gene search engine, we can, uh, we can enter the individual gene name and actually six scope can monitor microscopic gene expression patterns for the whole transcriptome. So for instance, pericentral genes like GLUL is only expressed in a uh, central area while the peri periportal genes like albumin and MUP20 can be found from the periportal region. So such details in uh, microscopic gene expression was only observed in six scope data set. And when similar analysis was done using formal special transcriptomics methodologies, actually such a type of fine microscopic details were not observed. And those uh, big differences are basically because of uh, big quantitative differences. So six scope was able to provide very high resolution down to uh, 0.5 to 0.7 micrometer. And also it can reveal many transcripts per area. So those kind of those types of quantitative differences led to uh, such a big difference in image quality. I only showed, showed the hepatocellular expression, hepatocellular expression, but the same data set also revealed the non-hepatocyte hepatocy expressions such as macrophage, red blood cell, and endothelial cell, and hepatic stellate cell transcriptome from the uh, unbiased uh, segmentation analysis. And we were able to locate those uh, uh, individual cell types as well. But the important thing is those non hepatocellular cell populations are dramatically increased when livers undergo injury and fibrosis. So we are able to isolate many different uh, uh, non hepatocellular hepatocyte cell types from injured liver samples. And 
Indeed, those uh, new cell types are really associated with uh, liver injury and fibrosis. And we were also able to examine them in a microscopic scale. And we can also overlay them with histology so we can associate specific pathology with uh, the transcriptome phenotypes. Because it has so many information, so much information, I just wanted to show you a simplified diagram. So I can, in this example, you can show that dead hepatocytes are surrounded by inflamed microphages, and then they are surrounded by injured hepatocytes, and then normal hepatocytes and macrophages are uh, far away from those, uh, uh, those injury sites. And same finding was observed through immunocomfocal microscope. And also similar findings were found from the fibrosis site where activated hepatic stellate cells and inflamed macrophages are in closely intermingled with each other, which is again confirmed through immunofluorescence microscope. So basically, I just showed the liver data, but the similar findings were also made from the colon. We can identify different cellular layers and also individual cell components, for instance, in the Colonic epithelia, we can find many different uh, uh, epithelial cell types, including stem cells and surface colonocyte, and many other cell types performing different actions. And also, we can identify many different uh, non epithelial cell types, including macrophages, B cells, entering neurons, and smooth muscles. And we were able to also identify the mic microscopic structures of all those cell type arrangements. And those uh, arrangements were consistent with uh, what we observed from uh, hematoxylin eosin staining of the same section. Basically, we were able to see that there is a boundary between epithelia and lamina propria. So epithelia and lamina propria. So uh, epithelial cells and uh, non-epithelial cells are only found in their corresponding histological locations. And also we can find uh, the cell-cell boundaries as well. And also, we were able to identify many different cell type specific marker genes, and how we can also examine how those cell type specific markers are expressed in the special space. So, because of the time, I will not go into the details of other assays, but six scope can also examine uh, some tissues like sclera muscle, which has elongated myofibers that are not amenable for the typical single cell assays but we were able to identify their individual myofiber types and their arrangements, and also many other subcellular features and other cell types. And especially, we can also identify neuromuscular junction signature, which are only observed in their uh, restricted anatomical locations. So these uh, details were, uh, were not approachable through formal special transcriptomics technology. Also, we were able to approach the skin, uh, skin diseases and the disease cell types associated with uh, uh, skin diseases like uh, acne. So we can identify inflamed, keratin uh, inflamed keratinocytes and their associated macrophages and my, uh, fibroblasts. And also we are able to associate them with a specific histological structure uh, at the microscopic scale. So let me briefly summarize what, we, uh, what our new six scope technology can offer in future. So typically, bulk RNA seq is often compared to making a fruit, fruit smoothie made out of a nice fruit tray. Uh, even though this can show the very uh, deep analysis, actually, uh, you destroy all the special information as well as single cell information. So single cell transcriptomics, in, uh, such as single cell RNA seq, can now you can individually examine the single cell transcriptome so you can identify different cell types and their transcriptomic contents. But actually, you still lose the special information of how the original tissue has such an arrangement. This can be addressed by special transcriptomics, but so far, the resolution of special transcriptomics are not enough to identify single cells. So basically, you are making just a number of different smoothies that has a special location. And now we are improving this with uh, multiple different technologies so we can have a near cellular resolution. But six scope can further advance this uh, through the field. And then actually we can have a real single cell resolution in examining the special transcriptome 
And with its ultra high resolution, actually, not only the single cell information, but also the subcellular information can be uh, obtained through the six core. So we are very uh, excited to apply this to multiple different tissues. So now we, within our department, in our university, and several other collaborators outside of the university, we are looking into applying this six core experiment into diverse organs. So I wanted to close uh, uh, finish my talk here. And especially I wanted to thank Dr. Chun Sok Cho who implemented all the complicated experimental procedures, uh, Jing Yu and our collaborators, Dr. Hyun Min Kang and Gu Zhan for making a nice uh, computational pipeline for analyzing these data sets and also our collaborators who provided uh, tissues and helped us with uh, data interpretation. So thank you very much and uh, for your attention and I would like to take any questions. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, you and he, that was really amazing. So I'm sure that you have a, a lot of people knocking on your door when to collaborate on, on all their different special tissues, right? Do you have like, do you have it set up for like a core facility or, or something like that? Or is that in the plans? Yeah, so that's certainly a plan for making this more accessible. So actually, we this is this, this technology is uh, still new. It, it, we have it, it has not passed uh, one year after we actually have uh, our first data, and then mm -hmm. we have worked uh, diligently on kind of optimizing and scaling up. So our initial data set was produced in very tiny one millimeter circles, and then we wanted to kind of expand the area so that we can analyze more tissues and uh, with less cost. And uh, we, are, we are still making progress and we are open to collaborations and testing the tissues, but so far the challenges would be mostly on the you know, tissue quality and uh, the tissue optimization protocols. So those, uh, th those things need, still needs to be optimized. And I hope that we are able to update some that you know, so that we can have a more defined pipeline of analyzing the tissues and also scale up. So it's definitely our interest to you know, providing this more as a service so that yeah, it can be accessible by uh, many, yeah, many, many different researchers. Yeah, that, that, that's a, that would be a great resource. Do you think that you sort of hit the, the end of, of what you can do with resolution or do you think there is a layer you know, beyond what you've done that you can go even more uh, higher resolution? So I think we almost hit the boundary of what we can do with uh, this yeah. uh, concept of methodology, because this concept of methodology is depending on the you know, nucleic, nucleic acid diffusion and capture. And then mm -hmm. since they will be diffused, we estimated the diffusion rate as around the diameter of one to two micrometers. So I think this is some micrometer resolution, even though, yeah, those are kind of will, be, will show the normal distribution. So I think we are almost at the limit. And mm -hmm. also at the data depth, it's, it's also very approaching the limit. And we think that we probably capture almost everything that are present within let's say a couple of micrometer thickness section, but since those are very narrow section, so probably what you will observe is, uh, you know, single plane examination from, let's say, confocal microscopy. So probably you will not discover a lot of transcription there unless you can combine, the, combine those. And another limitation that we wanted to address is, of course, the cost, because uh, uh, actually the array cost itself is very, you know, we. we we, we have bring down very cheap levels. So for instance, you can examine one tissue, let's say with uh, a couple of hundred dollar away, but the problem is the sequencing. So you need to sequence a lot to get a deeper. For instance, typical RNA sequencing will produce around 20 million reads. But if you that divide that with, uh, let's say one square millimeter imaging mm -hmm. area, you don't have that much depth. And especially for rarely expressed genes, yeah, probably you will not get that much count. So to, to kind of address those, we are using different approaches in targeting or you know, protein signatures. So we are still working on improving those aspects as well. Yeah. All right. Great, great. So um, a question that, that connects with what you just said, um, uh, Ji Feng Zhang is asking, in general, how many genes 
can you catch in each cell? Or I yeah, so the initial, yeah, our, our initial data set, actually we spent quite a lot of money into sequencing the samples. And then actually we, our estimation say that we only, we only examined, let's say around the 60, 50 to 60% 60 of total library co complexity, but still we can capture around 22 transcripts per micrometer, which means that if, we, if it is uh, 10 micrometer square, then it will be around 2,200 uh, unique transcripts. And like uh, big cells, like, uh, you know, hepatocytes, they will have, let's say, up to 50 micrometer or 30 micrometer diameter, and then it will be much more. So it depends on the cell type, it depends on the area of tissue, and also importantly, how deep you want to characterize. So yeah, you know, to get, you know, 22 UMI per micrometer, you need to sequence really, really deep. So mm -hmm. yeah, those are some kind of practical considerations of how you, how, how much information you wanted to get. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that depends on the, you know, application. So if you already have a single cell data set, you wanted to map them into the special space, what you want to kind of construct the de novo cell time mapping using the six scope. So that all depends on, depends on the mm -hmm. application, I guess. Okay, we have another uh, technical question here. Uh, can you explain how to uh, aggregate UMIs across different HDMIs to obtain single cell level gene expression? So far, what we have done is we perform the image-based cell segmentation. So from the, you know, we, because before we perform six scope analysis, we can, we, we perform the, you know, typical histologies, image staining like hematoxylin and eosin. And then we marked up cell boundaries and we collapse all the, you know, coordinates within that boundary into the single cell transcription. That's what we did for liver data set. And for colon data set, we used the, a, diff, a different colon and other data set, we actually use the different approach. So basically we do random gridding over let's say 10 micrometer square grid. And then after doing, after performing cell time mapping, actually we kind of refine those grids so that we can estimate the cell boundary. So we use the sliding windows method so that we can, uh, we, we can, we can oversample the initial data set so that we can identify the boundaries between different cell types. So there are, those are two, two different methods that we have uh, implemented. But of course, there may be another method of detecting the virtual cell boundaries just based on the you know, data set. So those uh, methodology, we, we would look forward to uh, further development in those methodology area. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see any more. Uh, I have a question. So you, you showed some pictures where you had looked at spliced versus unspliced. RNA. How do you, what do you look for in the unspliced population? Is it just intronic regions or uh, how do you, what, what are you looking at when you show those pictures of, of the nuclear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for, for that examination, actually, we used the uh, velocity analysis. So those analysis were actually done in single cell area to know what genes are being transcribed and what genes are being expressed so that they can have a temporal resolution. But we just uh, utilize them for, you know, plotting unspliced and spliced ones. So basically they detect, uh, I believe the spliced junctions, and then you see whether those are really unspliced region. For instance, you can see the intron or you, you detect the exon region. So do, and for the spliced region detection, probably we wanted to have, uh, you know, those spliced junctions. So only spliced uh, transcripts will show such, uh, you know, sequence. Okay, and then you had another picture of you showed like a tissue with lots of cells in them, and then there was a few cells that had a really dark nucleus for unspliced. Yep. But then there was a lot of other cells that didn't have that. Is that could you interpret that to mean that certain cells are really poor at splicing while other cells splice really well? Yeah, so those are really, really, really interesting observations. So actually we were initially puzzled of why some nucleus are showing the strong signal, but why the others are not. And actually that's because the tissue we overlay onto our special array has, is quite thick. So those are 10 micrometer thick. 
And uh, effectively, our methodology will only capture the lower, let's say, two to three micrometer. And then in those sections, some of the nucleus will be placed here, some of will be here, some, uh, but some of the nucleus will be placed downwards. And then we think that that's uh, probably there, there, there will be some variations in unspliced, uh, you know, unspliced gene expression, but it is also possible that they are specially, you know, distributed. So some, some, some nucleus may be very strong in HNE, but they are not very well represented in our data set. But some nucleus uh, will be very, you know, very weak in HNE, but they will be highly represented into our data set because they are more efficiently captured. Mm. Yeah, so I, I, we, we think that both are possible. So there may be yeah. some internal variations, but it is also possible that it is just because of the, their special arrangement. Yeah, there's so much to look at, right? I mean, it's so yeah. exciting to be able to look at things like this. And, and, and there's probably more questions than answers that you stumble upon when you yeah, look yeah. at still, 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 we are learning about the techniques and especially as we collaborated with multiple people, Actually, for some of some some of some of the projects, they, it's very challenging. For some, actually, we didn't expect, but it shows the data. So actually, we are still learning about how you know the processes are done. So yeah. ho hopefully, yeah, this develops further and it can make uh, good contributions. Yeah, it's it's very very exciting. So I want to thank you, Yun He, and also Zhang Gang before for great presentations, and I thank everybody for for their um, attendance. Uh, uh, I Long Key is giving a seminar tomorrow at noon, and he was mentioned earlier today about uh, the, the CRISPR. Uh, so that's at noon tomorrow, so you can uh, tune into that. Um, so with that, thank you so much from the uh, University of Michigan. Uh, have a great day. Thank you.